Well, hello. I'm Wendy Burton. I'm a GP from Brisbane, and I'm here with my colleague, Betsy Peach, who's a genetic counsellor at SOGI here in Brisbane. And we're going to talk to you today about your options for genetic testing. And we're going to start, as always we should, preconception, because Betsy, that's the ideal time, isn't it really, to have these conversations and do any testing that may be appropriate. Absolutely. Okay. So in order to make sense of the different tests that are available these days, I guess it's important to start with a good history. So Betsy, would you walk us through what's important in taking a history when you're considering genetic testing in the preconception situation? Certainly, Wendy. I think the most important thing from our standpoint would be a detailed family history. And when we talk about a family history, that means anything that's happened in the family in yourself your partner, your partner's family, first degree relatives, so children, brothers and sisters and parents, and second degree relatives as well, so as far back as aunts, uncles, cousins, and grandparents. The more detail you can have, the better information we provide. Okay. So Betsy, that's a whole lot of family to consider. What is it you're actually looking for when you're taking that history? Mm. In a preconception setting, what we're trying to understand is, are there individuals who have been born with birth defects? Are there multiple things that families tend to have? So different people have the same thing. Primarily as well, we're looking at a medical history of the mother and father as a couple in relationship to have they had previous miscarriages? Have they had children with birth defects? Have they been trying for a long time? So that we can have a better understanding of whether there may be something genetic mm -hmm. present in the larger family. Are there any concerns we should have, for example, around uh, recurrent miscarriages or stillbirths? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. If there have been recurrent miscarriages, it raises the possibility that there may actually be a chromosome change in the family, such as a translocation, where some people can carry them and have no issues at all, but when they go to have children, they can create children that have multiple chromosome abnormalities. Mm -hmm. In the presence of stillbirths, it may be that there could be a chromosome change in the family. It could be a brand new thing in the child that doesn't have an increased risk to happen again, but we need to investigate that more thoroughly so we can have a better understanding of possible recurrence risk. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've mapped the human genome, three billion bases. Is that what you do when you test couples preconception who want to know about everything? Absolutely not. <laughs> It is true, there's a lot of hype currently about what we've been able to do with genome, but what we need to understand is there is so much of that genome that isn't well understood. So when we do preconception screening, we focus on the things that are more common and more possible. And you can take that in steps from large genetic panels that can look at multiple things that people can have, or you can take it into the smaller steps of looking at the things that are more common in certain ethnic backgrounds. Okay. So you've mentioned ethnicity, so history we were talking about the family history and the reproductive history, but ethnicity that comes into it as well? It certainly can. What we've found is that different people from similar backgrounds can have an increased risk for certain conditions, usually recessive conditions, which means that you have an increased chance to be a carrier for a condition. It doesn't cause you any problems if you're a carrier, but if you happen to reproduce with a carrier of the same condition, you then increase the chance you could have an affected child with these conditions. A perfect example is people who are from the Mediterranean may have a certain type of thalassemia, which is a hemoglobin disorder, and people from Asia may have another increased risk for a different type of a thalassemia, and those individuals should be offered screening for those particular types of things prior to having children. So is it just our Mediterranean and our Asian um, populations we need to be concerned about with thalassemia? No, it's a great question. Um, there's always a chance that anyone from any ethnic background mm -hmm. could have a thalassemia. Also, it's important to understand that with the way the world works, you could have a background or an ancestor from regions mm -hmm. that you're unaware of. So certainly we start with more common and then we work our way from there. If an individual is found to be a carrier, we then would suggest that their partner be tested for the similar thing, no matter what we think their ethnicity background may be. Are there any other ethnicities that we need to be particularly alert to? Mm -hmm. I think one of the ones that's most common that people are aware of is the Ashkenazi Jewish background. 
we found that there's a number of founder mutations associated with that background. And we've often talked about that related to the breast cancer gene. Mm -hmm. We know that there's an increased risk for people from that background to carry a breast cancer gene, but it also goes into autosomal recessive conditions. And there's about four or five in the panel that can be looked at carefully. The most common one is actually cystic fibrosis. Wow, okay, so we understand a little bit about the ethnicity, uh, the history of pregnancy attempts, miscarriages, stillbirths, uh, parent history, uh, their first degree relatives, their second degree relatives, oh my gosh, so we've gone to the grandparents, the aunts, the uncles, the cousins, uh, the, sis the siblings, the children, oh, all right, so there goes my consultation, it's already like mm -hmm. totally gone in, in getting all that history. Mm -hmm. You mentioned though, looking not at the three building bases, but looking instead at the common things. So this is preconception, so we're not testing in this instance for Down syndrome, mm -hmm. but what are the common things? What are the, where are the discussions happening in mm -hmm. this field at the moment? Right now, there's quite a bit of intrigue in looking for three primary conditions in women who are considering a pregnancy, and these are cystic fibrosis, spinal muscular atrophy, also called SMA, and fragile X syndrome. And these are the three that have been recently recommended that should be offered to every couple preconception if we catch them in that space. Um, the reason the focus is there is that the outcome for these conditions can be quite significant and the carrier chance is actually thought to be high enough that anyone from any ethnic background could potentially be a carrier. So I believe I've heard that the incidence of those three conditions combined is on par with the incidence, the natural incidence of Down syndrome. Does that ring true? Certainly that would be suggested at this stage. Okay, alrighty. So those three, but there's more, yes? But wait, <laughs> there's more. There's always more, Wendy. <laughs> so, so that's from my reckoning here at the end of 2018, that's about the $385, 300, mm -hmm. $400 mark uh, to have those three tested. But how big do we go? Because I've seen lists. Oh, yeah. I have seen lists. And I don't even know, Lisa, I'm sorry, I don't even know what most of those conditions are. Mm. So presumably they're very rare, because if I ever learned about them in medical school, I've never met them and I don't remember. Mm. But how far do we go? It's a great question, and I think it comes down to individual choice for each couple. The hard part, Wendy, is when you start to expand to look for more things, you are going to find people who are carriers. Yeah. And as long as that consent is understood beforehand, it really doesn't matter what I'm a carrier for by myself. It matters what I and my partner carry together. Therefore, we need to be testing both partners in order to get the most information from those large panels. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of those things, quite frankly, I have to look up every time I look at them. They're okay. not common. They're extremely mm -hmm. rare. Mm -hmm. But if you've had a family history of stillbirth or multiple issues, then perhaps those things could have been present and we didn't know about them, so we weren't testing for them. So if there are families who are keen to look at lots and lots of different things, then those are options available as well. There are multiple different panels that are available and it would be very important for a patient who is interested to speak to a genetics professional because some of the panels can be quite costly. Many of them are done overseas still, but you can find different options that might fit your family plan better. Okay. So Betsy, I guess that brings us um, to a really important point. Um, obviously, as a GP, um, I have a knowledge base, but it's not as extensive in this field as your own. Um, um, so, but I'm a Brisbane GP, so I can refer to you. That's that's easy enough for me to do. But what about women in the regions? What about the rural and remote areas? What are their options in terms of information? Are there online resources? Are there telehealth options? How does this work? So there certainly are things that are becoming more available for people all over the country and worldwide. A number of different um, universities and genetic facilities offer telemedicine, video conferencing, and there are some online resources that are very helpful as well. Certainly even our own private clinic now offers telemedicine and video conferencing for patients who can't get physically into Brisbane. We can talk with them through their family history, provide them with resources that they can then take back to their referring physicians and help organize what testing is appropriate for them mm -hmm. based on the information provided. So Betsy, part of my role, I guess, that I see as a, a general GP is to manage people's expectations. Because goodness knows there's a whole slew of things that we can test for, but can we test for everything? 
you know, and I think that's the biggest point that we all have to make as clinicians involved with people who are planning a pregnancy. There's only so much we can do. You can screen for the things that are common with ethnicity, you can review family history, you can discuss maternal age and paternal implications as well, but no one can guarantee a healthy child. And everyone who's conceiving a child or planning a family needs to recognize there are things we won't be able to pick up during a pregnancy. The most common things that we usually discuss are things like autism or learning struggles. There simply isn't a genetic test that's easily available for those. Other things such as birth defects, structural heart defects, even minor things where there's an extra piece of skin on the side of the face or an extra finger or toe are things that we may not always pick up through ultrasound and certainly there's no genetic testing associated. With that, okay. So say for example a couple have chosen to have whichever variation of the genetic testing that, that they have, what do we do if it's positive? send them to a genetic professional, such as a genetic <laughs> counselor or a geneticist. Um, we need to look at that as a whole picture, and it does depend on what the testing is, Lindy. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking about screening versus diagnostic testing, again, it depends on the timing. Preconceptionally, we have time. So let's say, for example, that a patient decided to test for cystic fibrosis in herself. She was found to be a carrier. Our next instant recommended step would be to test the partner. Yes. If he's a carrier, we then need to think about this is a 25% chance that our child could be affected. If that is manageable for a patient and they choose to go forward with a natural pregnancy, then they understand that they have testing options during the pregnancy. If they choose not to, however, they may decide that they'd rather avoid that potential risk altogether and they may consider infertility, such as IVF, where they can have pre-implantation genetic diagnosis performed knowing that the embryos selected for their fertility will not have that mutation. Okay, so they can actually choose if they understand that they mm -hmm. have a one in four chance of having a child, for example, with cystic fibrosis. Yes. They can choose to select an embryo that does not carry that condition. Yes. Or that may be a carrier but does not have that condition. That's correct. Yes? And I think the hard part with that, and the reason again to do this beforehand, is because that can be costly, and that mm -hmm. involves infertility specialists, and that involves all of the implications of IVF procedures mm -hmm. and costs of IVF procedures. So a family needs to be aware of what they're getting into. Okay. So Betsy, in summary then, mm -hmm. for consumers wondering about the wonderful world of preconception genetic diagnosis, mm -hmm. we can't screen for everything. We can screen for a whole lot of something, but what we should screen for depends on your history, your family history, your extended family history, your ethnicity. It depends upon your appetite for risk understanding. Mm -hmm. We can't pick everything up. It depends upon your pocket because financially we're talking hundreds and hundreds of dollars and sometimes even into the thousands of dollars with no Medicare support at this point in time, late 2018, for this testing. So I guess once it gets a little bit murky, really good time to flick to some information from your genetic counsellor so that we can go further and make sure that individuals get truly informed information about make the choices that they make. Mm -hmm. The right testing at the right time yeah. frame for the right family. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks Betsy. so much. Thank you.